This is a production of Cornell University. My name, uh, welcome to the 2023 Web Webinar Series. My name is Limon Sarate. I'm a second year PhD student in plant breeding and genetics in Larry Smart's lab at Cornell University. Once again, accompanied by Tony Baracco, a current alum who has assisted me in this uh, webinar series and put it together in all planning and logistics. Uh, and lastly, I just want to mention that uh, this webinar series is a component of a larger project, which is the development of educational modules that will be freely available on the Cornell HEMP website at the end of the webinar series. And each module will have a recorded webinar, an instructional slide deck, with the teaching style of the subject and a set of high impact papers pertaining to the respective subject. All the webinars, this one as well as the future ones and the past ones will be available on the Cornell SIPS YouTube channel if you're interested in rewatching them or sharing them with uh, someone that couldn't attend. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Nerit Bernstein. She's a senior research scientist, head of the Cannabis Physiology and Agronomy Lab at Volcani Center in Israel. I had the pleasure to meet her and uh, work with her a little bit at the ASHS conferences. So, so it is very pleasant to have her here. Uh, the topic of her talk today is nutrient management uh, for optimized production of secondary metabolizing cannabis. Uh, I believe she has tweaked her title a little bit, but um, <laughs> so without further ado, please, Dr. Benson, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Louis, and welcome whoever joined us for the webinar today. Um, I will show you today some of our results concerning um, nutrient management for cannabis, We're looking, of course, on one hand at production, quanti quality, quantity, and on the other hand, in quality, which is critically, as we know, in cannabis. So first of all, just to explain why we need to do all this basic studies, basic work, is because since we, I mean, we know that cannabis is not a new crop. We know that it's a very ancient crop, probably one among the first crops that humanity has been used. And we know that it's been used for medical use. And because of this, it has a religion's importance for recreation and a lot, and a lot for commercial values. So it's been used forever. And then what happened? What happened, and this actually is important, why we need to deal with it, with the research on, on all type of levels, is that in 1961, there was an international single convection uh, that was signed on narcotic drugs. And basically, at that time, from this minute, from 1961, all research on cannabis stopped. So because cannabis was declared as a narcotic substance, not registered anymore as a medical product, definitely not allowed for recreational adult use, adult use. And when we think about it, and now it comes to why this is important to understand, when we think about this, basically the knowledge that we had on cannabis maybe it was from the 50s. But when we think about cultivation and agronomy and plant science in the 50s, compared to what it is today, obviously there is a huge gap. So in order to bring this, you know, once uh, in order, uh, once uh, the recent changes that occur in regulation. And cannabis is gaining in many parts of the world now a certain level of uh, of legal a legal crop, either for medical, for recreation, or for both, uh, or for both. And all of a sudden, from this illegal marijuana type crop, it has to be a modern cultivation cultivar, either for medical or for recreational use. And the level of knowledge that we had, maybe about eight or nine years ago, was almost zero. On this crop. Um, so therefore there is a need to develop innovative aquacultivation technologies to support the booming cannabis industry. And really I have to say that when we think of the level the, of agronomic knowledge that we need to have about cannabis, it's a challenge that I think that we've never faced with any other cultivar, any, any other crop before. Because we're not only dealing with uh, being able to produce sufficient yield quantity for the growers, we're not only dealing with sufficient taste for the users, we're dealing with something that has to be standardized because it's used as a medical a medical a, a crop. And if not for medical use, also for recreation or for uh, life quality, the level of the secondary metabolites that has a biological activity needs to be standardized. 
And this has never happened before. When we compare it to growing tomatoes or growing apples, I mean, it doesn't really matter if one side of the tomato is more red than the other. That means that it has more lycopene than the other because eventually everything is going to be chopped up into a salad or into a ketchup. It, it's not being consumed as medicine. And therefore, we're coming from a crop that has very, very little. Or we had until, I mean, seven or eight or nine years ago, we had basically no agronomic knowledge about into something that we now have to increase to close the plant science agronomy gap very, very quickly in order to pre prepare it and uh, prepare it to be used as, as a modern crop. So since there, there are challenges, there was challenges, there are still challenges and there are breakthroughs. I have to say that I was, because Israel was, I think the first country that legalized at least medical and the recreational use following the 1961 convention. And I was approached at that time by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture. And I was the first scientist in Israel to be licensed to work with the crop. And many people say possibly even in, in the world, I don't know. But uh, at, at that time, there were so many questions that were coming you know, from growers in Israel, growers in the world. And it was difficult to decide what to work on. Of course, we started working on nutrition because this is the fundamental things for growing. So what I, I just want to say that project in the lab ever since and today cover in, in our lab cover a large area of research topic. Most of them, first of all, centers on optimization of field quantity and chemical qu quality of the, of the product um, in terms of working on fertilization, light quality and intensity, plant architecture, trimming and so on temperature, humidity, and many other things. So there I will show, I'll be showing data on fertilization. Everything geared for chemical standardization and optimization of, of, second, of wanted secondary um, metabolites. Critical issue that you're working on is prevention of contamination, microbial contamination, heavy metal contamination, pesticide, that so little information is known about. Horse harvest practices, from the minute that we cut the, the cut it, what, how does the degradation of the, um, of, the, of the secondary metabolite and what's the connection between cultivation practices and post-harvest qualities and many, many other issues also related to medical that of course we will not be covering today. So today, as Louis said, I was, I'm going to talk about optimization of fertilization uh, or fertilizers for increased secondary metabolite production, of course, not neglecting also the quantity issue of the, of the yield. So it's plant development and biomass production versus or joined with quality chemical quantity. So that means that we need to affect plant performance. So how do we affect plant, perfor plant performance? It's very basic agronomic question, which, which tends to be very complicated when we, we are hitting cannabis uh, cultivation. But overall, we know that environmental conditions and cultivation conditions affect plant development and plant function. So plant development and plant growth, that means that it affects yield quantity. On the other hand, of course, environmental condition and cultivation conditions also affect second, not only primary metabolism in the plant, also secondary metabolism and the yield, uh, yield quantity. Uh, Yield quality, of course, not quantity. Yield quality in cannabis is, of course, based on production of the secondary metabolites. And of course, there's interaction between the two because the secondary primary metabolism and yield uh, plant development affect very much secondary metabolism and the quality of the yield. So there are already data, already we do from our labs, some other labs as well, that show that light affects uh, secondary metabolism and temperature and stress conditions. And today we will be focusing on effects of uh, mineral nutrition. So let, if we br briefly mention, you know, secondary metabolism, and hopefully by now, I mean, it's very well known that most we have more than a thousand known biologically active compounds in cannabis, a thousand, that's a huge number. And they're divided into sev several chemical groups. The three most, the largest one are cannabinoids, which are specific for cannabis or almost specific for cannabis, and then terpenes and flavonoids, which exist also in other plants. And of course, because we have interactions between them, the entourage effect on the biological activity, whatever agricultural production we will do, if we are thinking about the chemical quality, we cannot ignore 
compounds other than uh, uh, cannot grow other compounds than cannabis. And these, of course, are affected by two things. On one hand, genetics, so different strains have different potential for production, but this is only the potential, whether what will be produced and to what qualities secondary metabolites will be produced depending on cultivation conditions, uh, on the cultivation condition. And therefore the actual production is dependent on the cultivation condition and um, mineral nutrition has a large part of it. So when we started to work on mineral nutrition after doing a few studies in, in the greenhouse, we decided that we have to go back to what's known for many plants since maybe the 70s or the 80s or before that, and to know how much nutrients does the plant take? How does the, the, how does the cannabis plant respond to, uh, to nutrients? How much do they need in the first or second week of cultivation? What's the difference between how, the amount that they need in vegetative uh, uh, stage of development versus reproductive stage of development? So in order to understand the plant and to see what the plant is taking and how does the, the amount of nutrient that is available to the plant affect the production, we had to go into classical mineral nutrition studies, which are done in um, which are done in soilless cultivation. So this will be in pots, in mostly in a semi-controlled or controlled environment, uh, environmental condition, where everything is regulated: how much we give the plant, what leach be, be below the plant, what remains in the plant, how much do we have each of those micro and micronutrients, how much do we have in the leaf and in the flowers and in the stems and in the root, so we can understand and close the balance and then know how does the plant will respond to this. So the most of the studies that I will show today, and unless they'll tell something else, were conducted for this reason, as is very customary for classical mineral and nutrition studies that, that aimed understanding the uptake of the plant. It will be conducted in soilless cultivation in the pots in controlled uh, in controlled growing uh, growing rooms. So one of the first thing that we did is that uh, and this was probably seven years ago, so six years ago, is because no one at the time had an idea about you know what this plant is doing. So we check uh, and this I want to show you. We, we we actually discovered that there's an issue with standardization at the time before that no one was actually aware of this. So we took a plant and a plant, I mean, a very controlled experiment in which we did several treatments, but we checked concentration in the, of the cannabinoids and terpenoids and flavonoids in the top of the plant, center of the plant and bottom of the, of the plant, maybe primary in fluorescent, secondary in fluorescent and tertiary uh, order in fluorescent. And for, I wanna show you some brief just data. So if you look at, for example, a THC, from the bottom of the plant, center of the plant, and top of the plant, we see obviously that the top of the plant there is much higher concentration, so there is variability. The same thing we can see for CBD. The same thing we can see for, for CBG, and the opposite trend for CBN. This tell this told us at the time there is an issue with standardization, and it's very critical because this is a medication that patients are taking. So if the patients are taking twelve percent versus six percent, it's like taking one aspirin or two aspirin or two antibiotics or one antibiotics in one time. So the standardization is critical because the, the whatever the consumer is going to consume needs to be obviously standardized. And the big question now was how does how does environmental condition combine with this, interacts with this? Does environment does nutrient nutrition has uh, affects this? And there was no information at the time. So this is the one of the initial studies that we did. It was done by a master student in the lab at the time, Soyako. And we checked commercial fertilization versus addition of 20% phosphorus or addition of NPNK together or humic acid. Why humic acid? Because everyone at the time was saying that humic acid can improve THC production and CBD production and it's great. So we thought we'll try it. And what we found out, which was great, I mean, it was a breakthrough at the time to see that actually millinery nutrition have a huge effect on secondary metabolite production in the plant. For example, if we look at, uh, um, let's look at what, let's look at THC, for example, we see that humic acid actually reduced greatly production of, of, TH, of THC. Addition of, um, a NP, of NP and K increased production of CBG. And CBD was also reduced, reduced by um, humic acid, meaning let's not discuss right now what type of humic acid it is and whatever, that's the topic for a different discussion. But what this told us is there is a huge potential for mineral nutrition 
and for supplements to affect the secondary metabolite uh, um, production. So now we've done the same, the same experiment. This is part of the same experiment. By the way, the data that I'm showing you is all published and you can find it all online. In most, most cases, I put the references on top. So this is, of course, all publi uh, published data. And when we, what we did is now we looked at the same treatments, you know, the commercial treatment plus phosphorus, plus NPK, and plus humic acid, of course, in addition to the commercial treatment. And we checked in three different levels on the plant, on the bottom cent flowers from the bottom center and top of the plant, and we saw how is the, does it interact with the um, nutrition. And what we found out, and I just, just pointed one thing, for example, if we look at the humic acid treatment for Delta 98C, what we can see that all of a sudden the, the concentration are standardized. So at the at different location in the plant, we have similar concentration. This was a huge breakthrough. But on the other hand, it was standardized because it reduced the concentration in the top and in the center of the plant to a lower level. So that means it doesn't mean that that's what we want. Obviously, we want production of the wanted, the secondary metabolites that we are interested to increase. But it means that there's a potential for nutrient supplementation to affect also standardization or development in the plant. From, from now, from this point, we decided, okay, no zero information about response of the, of the plants, of cannabis plants with different nutrients, zero information at a time for how much the plants actually take up. So we started with a series, my, my, I started in the lab, a series of experiments separately for the vegetative growth of the plant and separately for the reproductive growth. Of course, cannabis is a short day plant. So under long photo period, it will grow vegetatively and only when under short for the period there's induction of flower development in fluorescent development and the um, and reproductive growth. So we've initiated those nutri for the first stage, the nutrient studies separately for the vegetative state growth and for the reproductive uh, growth. And I want to show you some of uh, some of our results. <clears throat> it's right now there is a lot of data, please focus on the image. Only. And this experiment was a response to nitrogen supply. This was done by Avia Sloner, a PhD student in the lab. Master student at the time is almost finishing his PhD studies now, studies now. And we really had no idea where to start with because there was zero information. So we started with a very large uh, range of nitrogens, uh, starting from 30 all the way to 320 milligram per liter PPM. And as and we can see, so these are the, the five uh, concentrations that we started. As, as we can see, under 30 ppm, as expected, this is a very, very low. The plants were small and efficient, slightly better under 80 ppm. 160 look okay, so did 240. 320 already suffered from probably toxicity. So we have a classical response curve to nutrients going from deficiency to optimal range of supply to over over threshold of uh, optimum, which is toward uh, toxicity. And if we look at the development, and if we look at the uh, graph, uh, numerical value of this, so we look at the plant height and biomass production and so forth, it follows the same thing. So this is leaf fresh biomass, and we can see here the concentration of nitrogen. We can see an increase until an optimum and then a decrease. Same thing occurs with stem, with a fresh weight of the stem, the same thing with fresh weight uh, rate of the roof. So it's a classical response, and we can we could identify that 160 ppm nitrogen is an optimal range. What happened in terms of concentration? You can, uh, in terms of concentration in the plant, physiological responses, respiration, we did dozens of measurements. You can, oh, I'm not going obviously to show them. You can log into the publication if you want and, and see the plant response, the physiological responses. But overall, we can see that nitrogen accumulation as, the, as nitrate in the plant increased with the increase of N supply. So it's a classical plant respond to a classical plant respond to nutrients. What happened in the um, reproductive stage of growth? So now we are talking about the flowering stage. The same five concentration of uh, nit of uh, nitrogen. But we can also see deficiency in 30 and 80 ppm's. We can also see beginning of as, as symptoms of unoptimal conditions under 320. And again, the optimum concentration probably is 160, although 240 will probably won't harm it, but it's not needed. So for the sake of economical condition for the farmers, 
environmental contamination, whether it's better to stick with 100 and, and 160, and we checked it for several varieties. But you know what? This is just biomass production. What happened when we actually went and analyzed concentration of the, the therapeutic um, the compounds, the biologically active secondary metabolites such as terpenes and such as cannabinoids? Actually, the best production was actually the highest production was actually in those sorry looking, hungry, nitrogen starving plants. That's where we received the highest concentration of uh, the, the highest concentration of those uh, compounds. So here are some examples. You can see in the, many more of them in our publications. But for example, if we look at cannabinoids and we look again at the concentration of the minerals, so THC, CB, uh, CBGA, CBD, CBC, all of them were highest under the deficiency conditions and they're decreased with, uh, with increased concentration. Same thing for most of the terpenes. Most of the terpenes were highest under the low concentration of nitrogen and decreased. Some of them were, some of them were, not, were not affected, but for many of them, and you can again look at the publication, highest concentration were in the hungry plant. So now, now we're in trouble. Are we going to grow those tiny hungry looking plants? Definitely not. We need to find ways, and that's what we're working on, to, to trick the plants to think that they're under stress of some kind in order to produce, and this is some of the work that we're working on in the lab today. So that was nitrogen. Nitrogen deficiency, best for optimal production. What about potassium? This is, again, was done by Avia Salona. So we checked it again, we had no idea where to start. So we had based on knowledge for agronomical knowledge for a wide range of plants, we checked a concentration from 50 ppm, which obviously was, we were hoping to shoot from deficiency to toxicity. From So we, we tried concentration from 15 to 240 uh, ppm potassium. And again, we can see that the 15 and, uh, and the 60 plants were, at definitely 15 was um, deficient, 60 was slightly longer. And then between 100 and 175, that was an optimum range, probably saying that 100 is sufficient and there's no need to increase much, uh, uh, to increase much, uh, much more than this. So this is for the vegetative phase. What happened at the, at the reproductive, uh, phase, uh, re reproductive phase of growth? Um, um, so this is again, the same five different concentration of, uh, potas of potassium. Um, of potassium. By the way, I have to make sure that it, I explained that the, the irrigation here was done, of course, by um, a fertil a fertigation. So that means that the fertilizer were mixed, uh, dissolved in the irrigation water, uh, in the irrigation water, and supplied to the plant as uh, as mixed. And the and also important to note uh, to note is that uh, most uh, nutrient uh, studies mineral nutrition studies, which are aimed into seeing how much the plant takes up, takes up. Uh, we use perlite as the growing substance because it's a relatively inert medium. So whatever we give in the irrigation, that's what the plant sees during the time of irrigation and later on. So there's very little in chemical interaction with the, with the soilless uh, media. And also we uh, adjust the volume of irrigation in every irrigation event to make sure that we have at least 30%, between 30 and 35% of leachate. So uh, flow, uh, flow down the down the pot, but this we ensure that we don't have accumulation, high accumulation of uh, nutrients in the, in the medium. So we leach the medium. And so that means that it, it's a, it keeps the concentration that the root sees rather, rather constant. So going back to potassium. So we look, we're looking at uh, potassium in the reproductive phase of growth, again, from 15 to 240 um, um, milligram per liter, PPM. And based on visual appearance and based on a lot of biomass measurement and physiological measurement, 100 PPM is the optimal range and it's quite sufficient. sufficient. However, what happened, again, when we measured secondary metabolites, uh, cannabinoids and terpenoids, the same thing happens that the highest concentration was actually in the potassium starving plant. So both for potassium and for nitrogen, the best production of secondary metabolites was actually in those small looking hungry, hungry plants. So now the grower had to decide, is he shooting for higher concentration, higher concentration or is he shooting for more biomass? 
And of course, another for those for those growers which don't sell flowers, but they they, they actually do extract, and they are interested in biomaster plant or biomass primitive square. We have all this data in the manuscript, and still the same thing occur. Obviously, that uh, uh, I mean there were higher concern, higher concentration, lower and lower this, and for the totals, it's possible to look at the manuscript. Um, just to show a result again for for the for the secondary metabolite production. So if we look at the on the x axis on the concentration and the different cannabinoids, so we see again this is what I was telling you before: the higher concentration of THC and CBD and CBDVA. All the most of the cannabinoids that we tested were highest under the uh, deficient, the nutrient deficient uh, plant, and it decreased with. And this is a, this is a data for some of the terpenes that we measured, and we can see, again, these are for two varieties, by the way. So we can see, again, the reduction, highest concentration for most of them was under deficiency conditions, but not for all of them. For some cases, some, some terpenes actually increased um, under, with increase in concentration. That means that it's not a general phenomena. It's actually a fact on specific bi biosynthetic pathways. So it depending if, someone is interested in a specific terpenes or specific cannabinoid or specific flavonoid, the specific effect of a, whatever mineral nutrient or environmental condition uh, in general will have to be studied. Just to show you that those re the responses, that the responses are, um, of the plant responses follow what we see in the visually and follow the results of the biomass. So for example, if we look, we checked many, many physiological parameters. I only show a few of them here. So let's say, for example, if we look at photosynthesis or transpiration or somatoconductance, and these are in two varieties of uh, two cultivars of cannabis. So we see again, deficiency plant, the, product, the fun plant function is lower. Then we have an optimal range of uh, plant function. And again, probably a toxicity range a toxicity range. And we say to be on the safe side, probably 100 uh, ppm potassium is more than is, uh, is sufficient for cultivation and the reproductive phase. Um, and these are, the, these are the biomass data for the same experiment that shows that under low concentration, of course, biomass will be lower than under higher concentration. And this is the, uh, this is the results for the inflorescence for the dry weight, so this is the, the this is the yield, and the yield. So we have a contradiction between the biomass, which increases with increased potassium and with increased nitrogen, and of course the concentration of cannabinoids and terpenoids that decreases. Phosphorus, right? The big three in mineral nutrition is N, P, and K, right? So we looked at nitrogen, we looked at potassium. But of course, we're now we're going to look at phosphorus. This was a study that was done. Uh, by Sivan, uh, Sivan Ciponi, a master's student at the lab at the time. And she was looking at uh, phosphorus in the vegetative uh, growth phase and in the reproductive growth phase. So let's look at the vegetative first. And we show here the results for two different uh, varieties. And again, we started because we had no idea where to start because there were no information. By the way, when I say no idea, it's not because I mean it, I mean there's no science-based information. If we were to look at you know, on on the web on the web on the website, what we like to say, Doctor Google, we find thousands of blogs, and many many of them were saying and still say up to today, uh, cannabis is hungry for phosphorus at the vegetative growth at the flowering stage. You need to put a short day phase. You need to put a lot of phosphorus at the time. Some blogs were saying as much as. 600 ppm or 1000 ppm. Now for, for whoever grows and has an experience with agriculture, you know that normally the maximum that we do in soilless culture in pots is 30. So I thought I was actually pretty brave by going out all the way to 90 because most of our regular crops will die under these conditions. But we said, who knows, maybe cannabis is really, really unique, you know, but going above this, you know, it's we, it, uh, there was no need and we, we didn't dare do it. So that we did a classical experiment from 5 ppm until 90 ppm. And I was wondering whether we will get toxicity in spite of you know, what we see by so many cultivators and growers that now we know that even use higher concentration. So let's see if it's needed, at least for our type of studies. What we find out that 
5 and 15 was not sufficient amount of phosphorus, but 30, you don't need to go above 30 for the vegetative growth rate. 30 gives a wonderful plant function, optimal cultivation. Something that we did find is that there is a very uh, large range of optimum range. So really from 15 to 90, there were no toxicity symptoms, even above 90. Biomass at 15 was pretty on the good side. In order to be on the safe side, we recommend to use 30 uh, ppm, but definitely there's no need to go above it. And this is uh, this is a, a graph, babies, of the results for biomass for the plants that we've just seen in the previous slides. So we see the concentration of phosphorus, and we look at the dry weight in two, here for two varieties, and we can see the increase from uh, all the way up to 15 and from 30 all the way up to 90, no change, no statistical significant change in any of those two varieties. And when we look at the, at the function of these plants, so if you look, uh, for example, at uh, photosynthesis and transpiration and stomatoconductance, we see the same thing, that you know, it, it maximum increase all the way up to 30, and then in some cases even, even decrease. So optimal function after 30 and really for not because of yield biomass and not because of plant function, we find in the varieties that we work with, we found no reason to go above 30. Interesting thing, of course, is what happened at the reproductive, um, at the reproductive growth phase. So what happens at the reproductive growth phase? Again, several varieties. We did experiment with those two varieties and uh, with the with two varieties, and we can see that the same concentration, that low concentration gave the plants were deficient, deficient, and they, but all the way up to 19 in terms of plant development and biomass pro production and yield production, there was no need to go above 30. The optimum again was all the way up to 90, so we didn't see any toxicity symptoms or oversupply under 90, but really there was no reason to go above 30. And what happened when we evaluated secondary metabolite production? The same thing that we saw for nitrogen and for potassium, also for P, also for phosphorus, the highest concentration was in those deficiency, in those hungry plants, in the deficient plants, in the, in the deficient plants. So when we, look, when we look at the data, the biomass, so again, what the plants that we've seen a minute ago, we see again an increase in dry weight all the way up to uh, up to 30, above 30, the increase is not uh, significant, uh, is not significant anymore. This is, by the way, is total plant biomass. This is in fluorescent biomass. Each one of those organ biomass can be um, is presented separately. And this is the, um, the same thing for different varieties. So we think very similar responses for both, uh, for both varieties. Uh, what happened about the secondary metabolites? So we presented some of them, they're more in the, publication if you're interested to look in. And let's look, for example, at the CBDA for two varieties, THCA, CBDVA, THCA, for many, for most of them, highest concentration, as I said before, were under in the deficiency conditions and it reduced with the increase, with the increase in the production. So as a grower, really it's difficult. Definitely we're not going to grow those hungry plants. You know, this because they are small and they produce small amount of bio, of the bio, of biomass. We have to choose somewhere, but increasing above the optimal is definitely not recommended because you are risking reducing the secondary metabolite even uh, even further. Um, in terms of plant function, so if we look at then at photosynthesis and transpiration and stomatal conductance with the different concentrations. So we can see again classical that in under 30 ppm it reached the maximum uh, function of, uh, of statistically significant in all of those plants. So there's no re no need to go way above 30 at least in the varieties that we've uh, that we've checked. Okay, so now we thought we know it all. You know, we checked N, P, and K, phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium. For all of them, biomass was increased until a certain level and secondary metabolite was highest under deficiency conditions. The Lit Morad, the master student in the lab, actually if we were just tested last week and finished a master, a, a master project, very successfully I should say. And this is a paper that's in press. It's just going to come up probably in a week or two be published online, uh, published online. And she checked, she worked on magnesium in the vegetative and on the reproductive uh, growth phases. 
And what we found here, again, we tried from a very low concentration all the way to 140, which is quite high, a quite high concentration. And we found out that 2 ppms and 20 ppms were below optimal range. But from 35 until 140, this was still an optimum range. So we didn't, so it's not a toxicity, we didn't identify toxicity level. But we, 35 is sufficient, you know, to, re, to receive optimal, um, uh, optimal growth and plant uh, development in the vegetative stage. We can see this, you can see this here tabulated for the biomass, uh, biomass production. So this would, uh, this would be the total of the plant. And here we look at the, at the leaves and we can see that um, above 30, we don't get increase in plant uh, growth. Uh, what happened in the reproductive stage, in the flowering stage, the same five concentration of uh, magnesium uh, was checked, and we clearly see deficiency symptoms in the, uh, under the low concentration. And then we see an optimal concentration all the way um, up, to, up to 40 in terms of, but this is four yield quantity, right? And also, by the way, I want to say the reason why those branches are falling down because in order to take a photograph, a nice photograph of them and put them behind the black screen, we have to remove them from the supporting wire. So the way we did, and then after photography, they're being put in. So that's not the normal way that they grow, it's just to show the plant. So it's a, what we found, okay, so for here we say the range is somewhere between 20 to 140 in terms of biomass yield, in terms of yield production, in terms of quantity. What happened in terms of quality? So we were kind of sure NPK gave us deficiency, the best concentration. Let's see what happened here. So you know what? This is now what happened for magnesium. Magnesium is very different. Is very different. If we look at the concentration of magnesium, increasing concentration of magnesium on the x-axis, and we look here, I put an example of some cannabinoids. Under the fish magnesium deficiency, we received the very low concentration of cannabinoids, and they actually increase, and we receive an optimum concentration under 35 ppm and only above 35 ppm for some for most cannabinoids we received no statistical difference for some of them there was a slight difference so again from the, the varieties that we took that, that we still, uh, evaluated there's no reason to go above 35 but you need 35 in order to make sure that you don't hurt your uh, production by the way it's um the physiology of why each one of those cannot, of which minerals are affecting differently is fascinating. In terms of magnesium, magnesium, for example, is critical for ATP function and for a function of more than uh, 300 enzymes in the plant. And it's important for sugar loading into the flow and therefore translocation of sugars and uh, carbohydrates to the flower. And it's critical for many, many other, um, other processes uh, it's a part of the chlor chlorophyll um, uh, chlorophyll uh, molecule, and it's important for photosynthesis for, photosy for activity of rubisco for uh, for, for photo photosynthesis. So the responses are not just responses for stress. It's not like we have nitrogen deficiency of whatever deficiency that's by why the plant increased, and because the responses for each one of those nutrients is can be broken down to physiological. Uh, factors that the plants are uh, that the plants are involved with uh, that, that the minerals are invo involved with uh, involved with. Um, okay. Um, in terms of nutrient, that's the, probably the, almost the last the last group that I want to very quickly show. And this is a work that was done again by Avia during his PhD uh, studies. Uh, for nitrogen, there are two major forms of nitrogen that the plant can take up. And they're very different. One of them is ammonium, which is NO3 minus, so it's an N iron. The other one is um, uh, so nitrate, which is NO3 minus, and then ammonium, which is NO4 plus, so it's an N iron and a cation, and it affects very much physiology of the plant, or even up to the level of pH of the cytoplasm and many other uh, co uh, compounds, uh, many other processes in the plants. So it's always a question, okay, we know how much nitrogen to give, what ratio of ammonium to nitrate should we give? So we tested this and it tested this as an experiment. We gave either 100%, so this is the percentage of ammonium in, among all the nitrogen that was given. So we either gave it as 100% nitrate 
or 100% ammonia or ratios of NIM. So this is, in terms of percentage of ammonium, it's zero, 10, 30, 50, and 100% um, from all the nitrogen that we gave in the plants. And the, uh, this again is also of course, of course published. And what we can see, even just by looking at the plant, 100 ppm ammonium, the plant did not survive. So all the pl plants died. 0% ammonia, meaning 100% nitrate, the plants were really happy. And we are looking at the biomass, it's easy to see, to see this on the biomass. We see that the highest plant, um, more, the, the best morphology, the highest plant growth and development actually occurred under 0% ammonia, 100% nitrogen nutrition, which is what cannabis prefers. How does it affect cannabinoids? So the same thing, we saw the highest production of cannabinoids under 0% um, of some cannabinoids under 0% uh, ammonia, so 100% nitrate for some of them. For some of the cannabinoids, the, the differences were not statistic, statistical. So probably we, can, we are safe to go all the way up to 30% um, ammonium if needed, but probably 0% ammonium is, is better for, uh, for cannabis. The last slide that I want to show that I, that I want to show today for the nutrients is um, deals with um, sorry deals with the way that we calculate the way that we need to calculate how much mineral to give the plant in every stage of growth. The studies that I showed now, or we have to start with somewhere. So we have to find out what's the response of the plant to different levels of those minerals. And by the way, we have conducted experiments in the lab in other nutrients as well, and zinc and manganese and many other, and others that, um, that we are in the process of summing them up for publication. But something, but this was steady concentration throughout the cultivation, throughout the vegetative or throughout the reproductive phase, other than doing flushing and yen, which means reducing level of concentration at the last um, week and a half of growth. But still, there's another level, many levels of um, layering that needs to be that need to be investigated in order to understand plant response. For example, that um, should we give different concentration every week? This depends on how much of the plants actually take up every week. At the beginning, the plants are smaller. Definitely, they take up less than when they're larger. And also, there are um, um, phenological differences that in different stages of development, the plant might need more or less more or less. So how do we deal with this? The, in agriculture, we usually try to develop what's called the position rate curves. What is the position rate? Is how much nitrogen is being deposited into the plant at the first week of cultivation, second week of cultivation, third week of cultivation, and so on. How much copper, how much molybdenum, how much iron, how much phosphorus, and so on. So we're working on this. And this is a, again, this is a publication that will come out very soon. And we're looking uh, in this rate, it's time after planting. So unlike the previous curve, we're looking at age, at age of the plant. This is the first group of curves is for the vegetative stage of uh, growth. And this is for the flowering stage of growth. So we cut the plants many, many times destructively and analyze how much min minerals in the leaves and the shoots and roots. So we can know how much the plant takes up every week. And what we can see, so this is just gram per plant. So we can see that, of course, as the plant grows, there's an increase in the amount of, of nutrients. Now, if we take the, the, diff the, different, the, the, the difference integral between one point and the other, this will give us the deposition rate curve, which means how much goes into the plant in the first week and the second week and the third week and so on. It's too complicated and there's no time to sh clearly show it here, but just what I want to show you that there are differences between nutrients. For example, if we look at nitrogen all the way up to the, the end of cultivation, the plant keep on taking um, nitrogen and phosphorus and, um, and iron and potassium. But if we look at calcium, no, they, they stop taking calcium much more early. Early. So for example, for, and this was done by the way for between three and five cultivars. So we know this is, it tells us, for example, that probably during this stage of growth, there's no more need to fertilize with calcium, and it also tells us how much to give at every stages of growth. So this is the next level I think that we need to deal with. What else do we do in the lab? And I'm not going to show this, obviously we're dealing with nutrition. I just thought that you may want to be interested or interested to look at some of our publications. We're dealing with light quality, so spectrum effect on plant growth, light intensity, temperature effect, 
studies about flowering control, a lot of work about post-harvest chemical changes to see what happened post-harvest and how can, how can we affect post-harvest by cultivation, because sometimes cultiva cultivation affect nutrition as well, affect post-harvest. Effect of botanical and conventional pest management treatments because we have to deal with contamination and many other um, uh, and many other issues. Let's take a look. Okay. Um, okay. We also do a lot of work on plant architecture. So, th um, and this is for standardization. If we look at a plant, we analyze conservation at primary and secondary in flowers. So this is these are the colors, so to speak, with more inner and flower scents, which have more shade, shading. And we analyze the difference between microclimates in the plant and stabilization and conservation. We did this on, on more than four varieties. It's published in two or three publications. This is control plants, plants that we, we only did defoliation, only removing the leaf, removing uh, leaves and branches from the bottom of a plant, only removing secondary branches and so on, one trim or two trim pinching and what two pinching to the plant. and. Uh, of course, in order all of this in order to see the effect on solidization and on the yield and on the yield quantity, we also checked and this was done by Nadav Dansingel, uh, who was a master student in the lab at the time, and also the same type of uh, plant pr uh, pruning. How do the, are they affected by plant density? Because plant density is very important. Whether you plant one plant per meter, two plant per meter, ten plant per meter, of course, it's a matter of Plant, the interaction between plant architecture and plant uh, density. To summarize, I want to say that, first of all, we found out and we know that mineral nutrition, and I showed today NPK and magnesium, has a considerable impact on secondary metabolism in cannabis. So there's a power and there's, there, there's a power and there's a potential for those in order to control secondary metabolism. We have to be careful with this. Second thing is that yield quantity and chemical quality are very often affected differently by mineral nutrition. And therefore there is an urgent need for science-based plant science, for science-based plant science information to support the developing cannabis industry. And plant science is important, you know, it's a basic for everything, for nutrition, for any economical uh, process. And so, there are many challenges and there are also breakthroughs. Definitely further, we need further development of our technologies for a improvement of cultivation, both for quantity and for quality. Development of advanced technologies for directing the chemical quality, so not only the quantity. And controlling the, the chemical quality is a major issue for specific chemical indications. So once we will know what secondary metabolites are required for whatever indication, it's not only a need to identify which strain, which cultivar works on whatever medical indication, it's also will be a need how to make sure that it produces the same profile uh, consistently within and between uh, batches of growth. And I want to thank my amazing lab group, which is a ch it keeps changing throughout the years. Many of them don't, don't want to leave and keep doing masters and PhD and whatever. It's a very, very difficult studying medical cannabis is really difficult because of the regulation. We spend a lot of our time under cameras and other motion sensors detectors and whatever. And it's a very dedicated group that was facilitated in order to the accumulation of uh, the information that we were able uh, to do. The funding for the studies that I show you comes from the Chief Scientist Fund of the Ministry of Agriculture in Israel. Because in 1916, cannabis was declared as a crop, a crop in Israel, which is a legal definition, it means that we are allowed to apply for funding to study this plant. And in the beginning, some of the plant material that we use came up from three growers in Israel, from Kendo, which is, we still collaborate with a lot with, from BOL Pharma and from uh, El Fonteva deal in the, in the past. And uh, some of the, we're working together with Dr. Molly Zaks from, from the Extension Service in Israel on the composition of the nutrient solution, which is not an easy thing to do in order to maintain such very good level of stability between the treatment. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, you have some, several questions and I'm sure there will be more as we are talking right now. So would you like for me to read the questions or you want to access them yourself? Um, I can access them myself. Okay. Uh, have you seen any modification? 
It's only me to see this, right? I have to read them out loud, the questions, right? Yes, I will appreciate if you can read them out loud, yes. Okay. Have you seen any modification in plant gender sex based on different fertilization treatments? Good questions. We were very uh, concerned about this because we were expecting that maybe under stress conditions, we will see sex change. The answer is no, we didn't. But we did see under stress if something went wrong with the irrigation system and the plants didn't receive irrigation, obviously that we had a male development, but not under stress with nutrient, uh, with nutrient in none of our experiments. Another question is, uh, could it be that the lower nitrogen level had a higher concentration because there was less biomass? Um, meaning the same quantity of THC, but less biomass, meaning higher concentrations. So this is a really good question. When we deal with nutrition and concentration of an element, we already, we many times think about what we call a dilution effect, which is what was, was described here by the person that asked it. So maybe it's the same amount that's being produced, it's just higher because it's under, um, because it's in less biomass. So the answer is that we don't think so. And because I, there's no time to go into too deep into metabolomics, but we've done for the nitrogen studies, we also have done metabolomics, primary metabolomics, that the study will probably come up really soon. And what we know that's happening is that it, our hypothesis was that under high, when there is enough nitrogen, what does the plant produce? It throws it into proteins, DNA, and so on, and growth, right? So under if there's enough nitrogen, there's enough growth and primary metabolism. When there's not enough nitrogen, we still get some photosynthesis. We still have energy, but not enough in order to build high nitrogen compounds. And that's when the plant, there's a metabolic shift. That was our hypothesis, and it worked out to be, this is the case, that there's a metabolic shift for production of compounds that don't contain nitrogen, such as cannabinoids. So we believe that under nitrogen, what we're seeing, we are seeing a metabolic shift under uh, to uh, level, we call them C-metabolites. Metabolites that don't contain nitrogen because there's not enough nitrogen to support growth, the um, production of proteins and or amino acids and, um, or nitrogen, um, DNA and RNA and so on. Um, okay. Another question is, does NPK affect a male? And, okay, this was already asked, whether we can use this for grading. So this is, I answer this. Another question is, did, uh, did you uh, estimate total secondary metabolite production per plant with the nutrient deficiency studies? For example, the deficient plants had higher concentration, but due to biomass reduction, or total secondary metabolite production lower. Okay, so we checked this and it's oh, it's available in the publication. You can take a look at it because we also thought maybe it can be for people who are doing extraction, maybe this can be can work out. You know, if we get low biomass, but huge amount of um, concentration, it still may be that for extraction, if we use, if we get more biomass with lower uh, with lower concentration, maybe the number, the, the amount, the weight of the secondary metabolites will stay the same. So this was not the case, and I mean, it was not the case. So when there's a reduction, there's a, the, when there's a reduction for all, for all plants. And you can see the, the calculations in our manuscript. Okay, another question. This is probably an ignorant question. There's no ignorant questions. Um, as I'm not in plant science, but I don't understand why the concentration of a nutrient should be transient in comparison in comparing impact of cultivation strategy was transient. I don't know what it is. Uh, the concentration uh, would be in external water supplied, but not absorbed in totally by the plant. What about total amount of water absorbed, size of the plant, rate of transpiration, and all the other variables? I would think this is like to, uh, talking about the relative impact of uh, seeding a child, of feeding a child porridge made of 50% oats and 50% water rather than 60-40. Wouldn't the key thing be the quantity of oats act, uh, actually absorbed, not to mention frequency of feeding? Okay, I'll explain the question. I think it's a wonderful question. The question actually deals, if we put it in agronomic terms, 
tells about the interaction between irrigation and fertilization. If we give, because I, what we were talking about, as I was talking about in this, uh, in the in webinar today, I was talking about concentration that we give in the plants. So let me give same volume with same concentration. And I also said that we, leach, we make sure that we have 30% of leachate, so we stay with stay relatively similar concentration. But what the question was, and is, it's a matter of also of how much we give, because if we give one liter with by concentration, with certain concentration, or we give two liters with same concentration, or we give three liters with same concentration, the total amount of nutrients that we gave the plant differs. So this is a good question. The reason why it's not an issue in our study is because, is because we're using, that's why in mineral nutrition studies, we usually we try to use inert soil, inert media, growing media. So we were using perlite and we have 30% of leachate. That means that even if we take now and give two liters, what will happen, the, the amount of water that will stay in the container is the maximum amount of water that the container can hold and the rest of it will leach down. We leach down. So once we monitor the the volume that leach down and how much we give and they keep it steady, that means that the plant receives equal amounts. They similar. The plant is exposed to equal amount, and in addition to to equal to equal concentrations. So I hope this was clear. If not, please ask again. Um, okay. Another question was, um, do uh, Is there a textbook that would capture much or all of this information? I'm asked this question very much. How come that you haven't published a book yet about mineral nutrition of plants? You know, it's very tempting when we only have nitrogen and potassium we're saying, well, maybe it's time. No, now there's still many, many ways to go. I think that there is a need, really. I think there's a need for a cannabis textbook. I think it's going to be very challenging because from the time that the text will, will begin to be written until it's being closed, probably the amount of information will double because people are just now starting to work to work intensively on it. And I fully agree that there is a need, you know, for te textbook um, on cannabis. We are thinking about it. Other people are thinking about it as well, but uh, we are not there. Yet. Not there. Yet. Can you discuss the concentration of nutrients you have reviewed in relation in relationship with each other? For example, the amount of N versus P in various stages of plant development. This is a really good, really good question. Um, a very important issue in plant nutrition is not only the absolute amount that we give the plant, but also the ratio between nutrients. So, and this comes from many for many reasons. One of them is that there's interaction between nutrients for uptake into the plant. So if, for example, we have in a soil solution, in a root solution, we have higher concentration of the calcium, which we worked on and we'll publish this soon, it, it will reduce uptake of other cations such as magnesium and potassium, for example. So this is one reason. Another thing, there can be interaction in the plant as well. There will be competition for uptake in the plant, competition for um, translocation from the root to the shoot and specific physiological interaction. So as I said, there is the, even though we are investigating this issue for several years, very intensively, very intensively, this is a first, this is a first stage. And because from my point of view, I mean, def, my point of view, we, we have to start somewhere. And because there's absolutely zero information, we, my choice, the way that I chose to do it is to start working on each nutrient separately, giving the next, the, the other nutrient in the optimum concentration. So after we finish, for example, the nitrogen concentration for, for potassium, we already optimized for in this experiment based on what we know. Of course, that there is interaction be, between nutrients. There have been a, one, a, a one or two studies that came up for cannabis that started to deal with interaction between nutrients. Um, between nutrients. So different researchers may have different um, point of view. In my opinion is that only now after I know what's the range, what's the optimal range, deficiency or toxicity range. Now within this optimal range, we need to optimize for, for ratios between nutrients. 
before we actually know roughly where the optimum uh, rate is, it's going to be almost impossible to have a grid of 300 or 400 treatments in order to do it. It's possible, but it also forces reduction in repetitions in the per treatment and so on. So what I think is that there are several stages. First stage, for my very important stage from my point of view, is to, is to, op to evaluate effect for a range of concentrations. A different issue is then is to evaluate for a range of ratios between nutrients, between different uh, nutrients, and of course to evaluate effects on different duration of uh, of growth. So this is, I mean, trying to close a, a research gap of thirty years. It's very thirty or forty years. It's very. It's we are heading to, in this direction, and we're working as fast as possible, as well as other groups, and definitely it's important. But I also want to say one last sentence is that because we've analyzed, I mean, in all of our um, studies, we invested a huge amount of effort in funding because mineral nutrition is really expensive. We didn't analyze only potassium in our potassium experiment. We, we analyzed almost all micro and micronutrients several times during the growth period in separate in the roots and the leaves and the stems. And the flowers and the flower, the flower leaves, and the sugar leaves, the flower leaves. So we have, for example, we, when we look at the different concentration of uh, magnesium, for example, we can see how it affected calcium. So it, we, it gives us an indication of what ranges of magnesium calcium will be affected, and what ranges of nitrogen phosphorus may be affected. And now, based on this information, which was enormously difficult. And expensive to and time consuming to accumulate, it will be it will make us easier to direct um, experiments that will study relationship between uh, uh, different ratios between different minerals. Can you extend on the effects of luxury feeding of phosphorus in the flowering stage? Um, we know that many of the growers uh, believe. I mean, it's a belief that if you use a high concentration of uh, phosphorus, luxury feeding, um, luxury feeding is giving more phosphorus. We also use luxury consumption, which is more important. That means that not always when there is a lot in the root zone, it will mean that the plant will take up a lot. Sometimes there's a lot high concentration in the root zone and the plant will not take it up, then it's less important. But in phosphorus, we see also luxury consumption. We, we saw it also for potassium. It's very well known for potassium. Meaning that if, if we gave more, higher concentration in the root zone, we had higher luxury consumption into the plant and higher concentration in the plant. So may, many growers believe and will give very large concentrations of phosphorus uh, during the flowering stage because they believe that it affects so-called bud. I mean, it's not a bud. Fluorescence is not a bud. Bud is something else totally botany, so I'm even hesitating to say the word. But I believe it will give a, a more denser and larger uh, fluorescence. And from our experiments, yes, and it's in the publication also, we do see that the flowers, the flowers themselves, not in fluorescence, the flowers themselves tend up to be larger. But when you, but when we measure overall biomass of the of the yield of the inflorescence. It doesn't change. And also when we change cannabinoids, they decrease and terpenoids, terpenoids decrease. So um, so everyone needs to do their own their own uh, calculation of what they're interested to grow. But in terms of in terms of yield weight, it doesn't help. In terms of yield quantity, I mean conservation of cannabinoids and terpenoids, it definitely damages. So it may end up being, and also one thing that's important, the fact that it looks more denser when it's fresh doesn't mean that it's going to be this way when the tissue dries out, you know, the way that we, the way that we dry and they cure cannabis. How many days after planting in the reposition rate curves study where the plants switch to reproduction cycle? Okay, so what we did is that in order to make sure that we get a good enough description of what happened in the vegetative rate of growth, we actually did it in two batches, meaning we grew the plants in the vegetative stage longer than what we normally would. I can't remember offhand, I think it was 40 days or 45 days, something like this, or 30 days. 
but and then of course in in parallel we had another group of plant that was switched to the reproductive stage as customary with the cultivation so we, we dragged the vegetative stage a little bit longer in order to see that we get a, a good description of uh, the vegetative development thanks okay why do you think nnp deprived plants produced more desirable compounds so for nitrogen, I already answered this. I said that we believe that there is a, our hypothesis was that there is a metabolic shift toward production of low nitrogen producing um, compounds such as cannabinoids and in uh, metabolic studies in primary and secondary metabolomic studies, this was, we've shown this to be true. It's a paper that we are just submitting for publication this week. And for phosphorus, um, we can only guess. I mean, we know that phosphorus is part of ATP, so it's part of the energy budgets of the plant. It's, it's part of anything, really. So we don't right right now we don't have any working um, experiment in order to work on phosphorus because we for we because we are dealing with many other nutrients in terms of metabolomics right now, but it, it can basically be very much be because, you know, phosphorus is involved in so many en so many en en enzymatic reactions and in energy utilization in the plant that it just shut down uh, activity, maybe. So, because it, I mean, instinctively it makes sense. It says if there's a reduction in biomass, that means that the reduction in energy, there's a reduction in production of secondary metabolites. It sounds, it sounds logical. Here we received an increase, an, um, an increase. So we say it's possible, it will, really will mean that, um, that maybe some kind of production is, um, is uh, inhibited under deficiency more than other type of metabolic production which may, may be causing this. So maybe the downstream metabolic processes are inhibited because of phosphorus deficiency, which allows other metabolic processes to continue toward a production of a terpenoid and cannabinoids, which share, of course, a, part, a partly a similar metabolic process, a process, a processes. And it's a good question. That's a, and I also have to say that I, I'm so happy that we've reached the stage in which we can even think about it because now we know that this is the case, you know, about uh, two years ago, three years ago, we had no idea. At least now we, we know what the phenomena is and it's time to start, time to start working on the, uh, on the mechanism for why this is happening. Um, another question is, is research of elements showed in this presentation done on clones, meaning cuttings or from seeds? If from seeds was seed from seed a difference a affected a differently affected the results between the plants. Okay, great question. Um, first of all, the the study was done with clones and it was done with clones from similar from same mother plants. So because the lab in in order to get the differences that we were able to get, there's such very small variation between treatments, and uh, between treatments we are we are freaks for uniformity of cultivation conditions. I mean, people often ask us, how come, you know, your standard errors are so small, standard deficiencies are so small for biomass and for height and for cannabinoids and maybe, this is because we invest a huge amount of energy and thought and effort into making sure that our, rep um, our um, replicates are, are similar. And it's come to the fact that, for example, we start from clones. Obviously, if we start from seeds, probably a lot of the trends that we'll see, we won't be able to see because of variability. So we start from clones with sim simple, sim uh, same mother plants. We start with probably about half more clones than we need with, than we need to. So we, we, I mean, we generate probably like twice as many clones as we need. So at the beginning of the experiment, we can, we can sort them for uniformity of morphology and size. So they're very uniform when they go into the experiment. They don't even have one centimeter difference between them when they start, so this allows us. And in the cultivation room, every week we go with my light meter. We try to, every, to eradicate every variability that has a large effect on the plants. Light obviously is one of them. So the student, uh, the student goes in the, uh, in, the, in the growing room and every week measure light intensity in every 
20 centimeters, 20 centimeters, I think is maybe 15 inches, 10 inches, I forgot, on the grid and adjusting the light, uh, light intensity of the reflectors or whatever needed to meet to make sure that we have absolutely uniform conditions. So this is why we are able to get very low uh, variability between replicates and this wouldn't have been possible with seeds, not with the level of uniformity of lack of uniformity in, in genetic material from seeds as we have today. Okay. When looking at individual nutrients, how did you supply the other necessary minerals for normal growth? Um, this is very good question, a major question in mineral nutrition. We have a problem in, in science or we're probably in the world. It's impossible to take magnesium and just to add it into the solution by itself. Meaning if we have a solution that's made out from nutrients, you, you cannot break the salt and add. So you have to add it. It is as magnesium sulfate, magnesium nitrate, magnesium chloride, whatever. And so it's difficult. So what we do, we don't start with a uniform growing condition. We have, we, we make, before we start, we actually, um, we have recipe, we built recipes that, that make that make sure that we keep as much as possible all other nutrients uniform and change only the nutrients that we, that we need. In terms of magnesium, for example, it was possible to do it for, for we were able to keep all nutrients constant because of playing with different salts all the way up to the fourth treatment. For the fifth treatment, we had we had to select another ion that will increase. And now the question is, what ion do you select? And it's a major issue in mineral nutrition. In magnesium, for example, at the fifth treatment, that was 140 ppm, all the way, uh, only at the last treatment, we had to add an anion, a different anion, and we selected to do it with sulfate, um, with, uh, with sulfate, because sulfate, we've checked in previous experiment, it doesn't accumulate to higher concentration in the plant within this, uh, within this range. So all of the treatment, treatment one to four received, if I remember correctly, 83, I think 80, maybe 85, I forgot exactly, PPM. And in the highest magnesium treatment, it was, it was a bit higher. It was around a, a bit, it was around 120 or 130. This still is within the range of reasonable sulfate concentration for the, for the plant. And also we know from prior, prior experiment that it doesn't have an effect. It's a great question, and it's something that we deal with nutrients, with mineral nutrition all the time, and we do the best. That's why we don't use fertilizers. We, we use salt, actually lab salt, to mix individually each one of those treatments, and we build it the best we can to make sure that we have we don't deviate from, that's not within the should be that we keep as much as possible constant concentration of all other nutrients. Did you notice in CBD, CBG plants, that running fertilizer at the optimal point would increase the THC content over 0.3%. I've heard phosphorus uh, in particular could cause this. Um, well, the varieties that we used, um, most of them, I mean, we for some of the studies, we used a high THC variety, a high CBD variety, and a balanced THC CBD variety. Most of them, but we have most of them were not done with only a high THC variety because of the large interest that we have in in, in Israel. And in Israel, we don't have the 0 0.3 restriction because all our cultivation has to be done in greenhouses and indoor. Nothing is in the is in the, nothing is in the field. We're not allowed to grow because of scares um, worries about contamination from the soil. It all has to be soilless cultivation in in the greenhouses or in a growth chambers or indoor. So I don't have a very good answer about CBD only variety. They, they don't have a THC. But from the varieties that we have, from the balanced uh, varieties and from throughout the experiment that we have, we noticed that, I mean, the, at least for the effect on, the, on phosphorus, um, the highest concentration we received under phosphorus deficiency. So this was true for CBD concentration, for THC concentration, for CBG concentration, for all of them. So actually the highest concentration were under deficiency. And the more we increase phosphorus, all those, the concentration of all this reduced. So now we didn't find an increase with the, in THC with the, 
uh, with an increase in phosphorus. The opposite was actually true. Could growers implement a targeted NPT restriction near the end of the reproductive phase to achieve similar levels of increased secondary metabolite concentration? Or does the nutrient stress need to happen over the entire lifespan? Great questions. We are dealing with flushing, right? Um, just to tell you that we are actually finished writing a manuscript about flushing. We didn't have time to load it again. Um, for whoever is maybe not uh, done, uh, we're not familiar with this. Most growers, um, most growers at the last uh, week or week and a half, ten days or week of uh, cultivation, some use different durations. They either completely stop giving fertilizers, so they give just wa uh, water, or reduce some of the fertilizer. This is called term flushing in the cannabis uh, jargon. And the, the question is here, can we, um, it's, it's very logical. It says, can we just give nutrients, whatever we need, but just do flushing at the end, and this will re replace the need for, to give deficiency concentration. So first of all, I will have to say that all our studies were done with flushing. I mean, many of them we've done because we didn't, we asked ourselves the same question. We did actually grew double the amount of plants and we did half of them we flushed and half of them if we didn't flush and the, 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 those that the flushing versus non flushing will come up in a different experiment in a different study in other words no it doesn't help and the reason is that um, the reason is that the production of secondary metabolite doesn't start at the last week of cultivation it's a process you know throughout several weeks before it so probably this is what they're affecting. And also it's a, probably a matter of overall energy balance and availability in, in the plant. So, but this is again, these are all issues of when, I mean, not necessarily during the last week of flashing, but can we give it at the last half of the cultivation? Can we give it the center of the cultivation? All these are questions that need to be worked out. And these are definitely questions that we will need to, to work about. It's very important to work about them. What are the best journals for getting primary literature on cannabis cultivation? Um, well, um, if the question is about uh, scientific journals, and I'm going to ask answer with scientific journals, then um, I think that the I think that the uh, publication, scientific publication about cannabis, has been published in many journals. I mean, uh, in many journals, there are two journals which are specific for cannabis, or actually three. The, the third one that was initiated, but not necessarily these studies will be will be done there. And we see the cannabis cultivation anywhere. You know, I don't even want to name names of journal because really it can be found anywhere. The question is, are they available to the public or not? Some of those will be open access, meaning that you can just punch in and download the PDF with them. And some of them will be accessed only through libraries or through paying directly to the publisher. So the best way is not to search, to my opinion, not to search specific journals, but what we do in science is to search keywords. I mean, if, if someone doesn't have access to scientific databases, they just use Google and write cannabis nitrogen, cannabis phosphorus, cannabis nutrition, so on. And this will direct, in addition to the non-scientific or, or looking Google Scholar, then it will direct to scientific uh, publication that's dealing with these whatever issues of, or of interest. Are you doing any CO2 enrichment studies under enhanced CO2? Would you expect greater nutrient demand? Um, okay, that's a good, uh, that's a great question. Um, we didn't do any CO2 enhancement studies. Um, there are several reasons to them. One of them we're trying to mimic also greenhouse cultivation, but all our rooms have very good, I mean, uh, very good uh, uh, ventilation. So we are working under amb ambient CO2. It never goes below so it's CO2. But it doesn't never goes below ambient uh, CO2 concentration. So our, in other words, concentration are in our growing room are identical to the concentration which are outside because of the way that the replacement of uh, air circulation in the in the in the grow in the growing rooms. 
and is it going to affect uh, to affect mineral uptake? If it, the, the, I think the answer is that if it's going to affect growth rate, then it's going to affect mineral uptake because minerals are needed for growth. If we need more leaves to be produced, then we need more nitrogen for protein. We need more calcium for cell wall, for example. This is very simplistic. So if there'll be more growth, there'll be more need for uh, for nutrients. Uh, for nutrients. In, on top of this, it may have um, CO enrich CO2 enrichment, of course, may have an effect on specific uh, on uh, specific processes, uh, metabolic or others in the plant, which may theoretically affect need for for nutrients and then potentially mineral mineral uh, uptake. This is when working, and of course, CO2 will affect photosynthesis, which will affect energy. I mean, carbohydrate. Uh, CO2 fixation and carbohydrate availability, all this can have an effect, but whether it goes above, above affecting specific growth processes, it's something that needs to be investigated. Do you expect the result? Louis, you, if we are over time and you need to stop us, then stop us, okay? Uh, I have no problem. Like I have the freedom of extending this as long as I can, as long as we get to all the questions. Okay. So I don't have okay, any problem Okay. Do we expect the result? Uh, do we expect the result to be consistent across different growing media? Um, okay. The question is, what is the result? I mean, the result that we were shooting for, that we were receiving, is the effect of different concentration in the root zone on plant function, because the way that those nutrients were done is with a media that's as soilless, as a inert as possible enough leaching so we don't build up concentration of the plant, so which allows us to really focus on the response of the plant to a steady concentration, to a uniform concentration in the nutrient solution. Now, what happened if we use different growing media? So we know, of course, that many of the, in Israel, a growing number of um, cultivators is using perlite, but most cultivators, of course, is using media rich with the organic, organic media. The main difference will be one of the differences will be that the nutrients will be sorbed to the uh, to the media. So if the media is less inert, then we have sorption and, and desorption of the of the nutrient. They can build up to higher uh, concentration. That means, on one hand, that we will need to supply more to overcome whatever is remained in the roots of, in the media is sorbed to the media. And on the other hand, there's a, a, a possibility for the media to release. To release. So the, the way to do it, and this is the same as asking when we grow tomatoes in heavy soils or in sandy soil, will the response be different? The plant itself in large is going to behave similarly, other than the fact that the media can affect the root development and morphology and so on, but the plant itself is going to uh, respond differently. We just need to account for different interactions with the, with the media itself. But the first thing is that to understand what the plant needs, what the plant takes up every week, how does it respond when we supply this and that concentration? And then we, we need, and after having this understanding, then it needs to be adjusted to different growing media or different soils for other, uh, other, um, for other crops. Another question, have you ever analyzed Bedrocam products? Do you think if they are, really standardized since that is their marketing pitch. And we all know that in Canada, they were not standardized. Uh, thank you. I have never analyzed Predocom products. I don't know. But, uh, um, are your paper open source? Um, I try my best. I mean, let's say that uh, if uh, I'm a researcher at Volcani Center over 30, 30 years now, and before cannabis, I mean, the, the criteria for selection of journals might have been different, but with cannabis, we I feel kind of a public responsibility because I know that so many people are interested in those data that I, I do my best to publish them uh, open access and mo most large, really large uh, percentage of those publications are published in uh, open access journals. Several of them are not, and I always tell people that if they come across something that it's not available to them, please feel free to contact us 
and we're uh, happy to share those publications. But I think that about 80% of our publication, we pay huge sum for open access or the, actually some of the journals, many of them contact us, they really want to publish those publications so we get them open access for free, depending, because we know that there is a huge interest in um, the publication. It's a, uh, we're sometimes amazed by, you know, with those journals publish them, them and uh, we look at the paper a day later or two late day later, so we see thousands of people that downloaded them and looked at them. So we know that it's important to let people uh, have access to those, uh, to have to have access to those journals also to uh, people that don't have uh, access to scientific library. Are there any plans to perform deficiency studies based on leaf tissue testing to account for growers who are not growing in inert media? Wow, that's a, uh, okay. I'm telling you all my secrets, that's okay. I have to tell you that in all of the study, the question for those, uh, that's to explain this, how important this question is. Uh, the question is really asking about um, um, evaluating what the plant, what the nutritional status of the plant based on analyzing um, leaf concentrations. Um, uh, so we call this an agronomy, we call this representative leaf. What does that mean? That we identify on a plant, like it can be a basil plant, a tomato plant, pepper plant, we identify what's called a representative leaf, a leaf that in every stage in the, in the growing cycle, we can go to it and sample it and we know what concentration to expect if the plant is under optimal condition. So developing those tables of representative leaves are a great way of assisting, uh, um, assisting growers to, that want to know what their situation is, is, is to create those tables that says in this stage in growth, this is what you expect in the leaves, nitrogen, potassium, sodium. In the flowering stage, this is what you expect in the leaf and no water. So, de so developing a concentration in the in the, the representative leaf is very critical. What I want to tell you is that in all of the experiment that we conducted in the lab, all of the experiment, in addition to analyzing concentration in leaf root shoot, we also sampled representative leaves from hundreds, thousands of samples. And now after we finish this, actually all the students, the, those that left the lab, they left the lab, got together the last couple of months, the last two months, we finished analyzing all the leaves and actually we are in the final process of putting those tables together and they will be published, uh, published soon. So it will, it will give us, you know, what actually we are generating with this is that for every, it will be separate for the vegetative state and separate for the reproductive state. And based on the five concentration of nitrogen, we know under optimum condition what it should be. And we, this will be a first step into generating those concentration, um, optimal concentration for uh, cultivation. And I think that other people are working on this as well. This is very important. Okay. Have you investigated the accumulation of heavy metals in inflorescence? Gosh, every one of those questions, I have to say, yes, it's in the process. So I will have to tell you that uh, this is a issue that major concern because uh, major concern because cannabis is considered to be a, 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 a plant that be, can be used for bioremediation, meaning some plants can take up, they have a tendency to take up high concentration of heavy metals and other contaminants as well, and to survive it well up to the point that it's considered to be used even for cleaning soil. So cleaning soil and hemp is considered to be a plant that's good for heavy remediation. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that you know, when we're thinking about contamination, that in Israel, we're only allowed to cultivate the cannabis under soilless cultivation. And we have to test, we have, by, by law, we have to test the conservation of everything, um, microbials, heavy metals, a huge number of, chemicals in the soil before we even plant. We plant the plants, this is by, by law. But so we were concerned about it because normally in those uh, soilless uh, media is being used, there's not that many heavy metals, but even you know some of our micronutrients such as zinc and copper and uh, iron, they are heavy metals, you know? So we were considering what happens, you know, do they accumulate only in the root, do they, are they in the stem, are they in the leaves, do they accumulate in the inflorescence? 
And actually, Tamar Beigel, a master student in the lab, is working on this issue. We did two things. We just completed, uh, I'm telling you all the secrets again. We just, it's not secret. It's, we just completed a, a study in which we gave the plant different mixes of different heavy metals. And we are analyzing to see how much of it actually arrives into the inflorescence. One thing that I can already say, and this is not from this experiment, this is from data that you can look in our publications. If you look at our publication, we because we analyzed a micronutrient in all of this, so we, could, you, we can see where in the plant are zinc and manganese and copper and iron accumulate. And what we, we can see that many of those heavy metals, luckily, we retain in high concentrations in the roots. So they, they do move to the inflorescence, but under we see higher accumulation in the position in the roots and sometimes lo lower the root to shoot the translocation. Whether this is true also under high, specifically high concentration of heavy metals, this remains to be seen. Um, okay, the last question is, I know that hemp can control weeds eff uh, effectively. Do you think it would be appropriate to use it as a cover crop? Um, I, I don't know. It's a, I don't have an experience with hemp cultivated in the, in the field. You know, a, I have very little experiment with hemp cultivated in soil and a, I have no idea. It will also be an issue, I think legal issue of a, whether or not, but I really don't know. I think that that was the last question. That was the last question. I can just say quickly is that there are some, um, there's a professor at Cornell that is working on on that cover crops, using hemp as a cover crop. So that is just coming up. Well, um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Brancy. Thank you so much for all of you uh, to attend and be interested in sticking along uh, for the extra 30 minutes. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was very informative. Certainly there were a lot of questions this time. So that is, that's great. Um, so just next time in two weeks, actually on March 8th, please join us for our fourth seminar on outdoor cultivation and nutrient management by Dr. Heather Darby from the University of Vermont. So I will see you all in two weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you, Luis, for inviting me to talk. It's always a pleasure. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.